G'day guys, it is the coach and he is here on his first stream for 2021 and I couldn't think of a better way to start 2021, not talking lists, not talking gaming, we are talking all things armies on parade and it's something that I first entered this year, I learned a lot through my process but I thought, who could teach me more about what I need to do for the upcoming year and future years than an award winner, someone who I admire when I saw that on Warhammer Community. I saw it on Twitter. I couldn't think that there was a deserving winner. It is K Kit Reich. Uh, trying to remember my Empire Dramatic. I was listening to Ramstein earlier today, so my dramatic, my dramatic tunes are like, book dish. I'm good. <laughs> But Kit, uh, Kit, welcome. Hello. You did pick up an award in the, the Armies on Parade 2020, and I want to pick your brain. That's really what I want to discuss with you, mate. Welcome to the channel. Sounds great. Thanks for having me, Anthony. It's uh, it's an honor honor to be the first guest of uh, 2021 as well. Yeah, so. I couldn't believe yeah. it. It's, it. In Australia, it's now the, the 2nd of January. Right, uh, right. But I'm joining you from the past on. here. <laughs> From the past so for anyone who's not familiar with you so i'm very familiar with you because you are a, a wonderful person to follow on twitter you are a hobby hobby butterfly uh, a very good hobby butterfly at that um what how would you how would you best introduce yourself other than being an absolute champion yeah <laughs> yes that's, that's generous um yeah i'm i'm you know definitely more of a uh, kind of a hobby painter than a gamer um i do like playing the game but um you know, where, where my my kind of joy from the hobby definitely comes from from painting and, and making terrain and things like that. So, um, yeah, I guess my you know my story is kind of kind of typical in the sense that um, you know I I sort of got the bug early on. I had the I guess the blessing or the curse of having an older brother who introduced me to Warhammer, depending on how you look at it. So, uh, kind of got hooked from an early age. Um, was really into it, then went off to college and completely left it behind for a good decade or more, and then kind of came back, you know, recently in the past few years. So, um, yeah, just kind of get back, got back into it, got um, uh, excited when, you know, Age of Sigmar started coming out and kind of got, got back into the hobby, so. No, and, and, and yeah, and, and and just following your your hobby journey has been quite amazing. Uh, I, I've seen that you know I've got a picture in. I'll, I'll share a picture a little bit later. But you have been featured in White Dwarf. You have picked up um, some awards at events. I think you picked up some some LVO awards in the past. Yeah, yeah right. Um, uh, and obviously now you've got the, the crowning achievement of an Armies on Parade award. So um, that was really cool. And I know we've both coming from this from a very different lens. So I came in from a very display board orientated lens you've come in more from a, a painting side and i think maybe that's probably a really good place to start first is that what is armies on parade and you know why would you enter and maybe i'll let you describe you know your your perception and, and what motivated you to do armies on parade because i know it sure. seems like something that people have on their bucket lists to do at least once they either want to enter uh they, they aspire to enter it or they they don't they want to do it they just don't know how to do it yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, so um, so this was my my first time participating in Armies on Parade as well. Um, but yeah, I went about. Um, I mean, I guess I, I guess the whole impetus goes kind of way back. You know, uh, this I think we're around the same age, Anthony. I, I imagine this kind of sounds familiar, but you know, from a young age, looking at the you know white dwarf army photos, the the huge spreads with the you know painted backdrops and the the two full armies and it was like the it was always in all caps at the very bottom of the uh, <laughs> of the this amazing photo um, you know some some brief caption about it but I loved that stuff and it just uh, just the whole spectacle of you know not just the armies together and the um, you know the boards but the all the terrain the backdrop kind of the whole kind of spectacle of it was real you know uh, it kind of got me excited about making terrain painting and also kind of making things that um, could be displayed alongside the army or with the army, right? So, so Army Sun Parade is kind of, that's exactly that, right? It's kind of the, it's sort of the ultimate kind of expression of the hobby in that sense. You know, you have the models, you have painting, you have terrain, you have kind of the whole, um, you know, the lore aspect of it. So it's, um, yeah, that that is kind of right up my alley, so. 
And for anyone who doesn't know exactly what we're talking about here, uh, Armies on Parade is a event that happens every year by Games Workshop uh, that you traditionally, and I, I don't know how many years uh, Hobbies, uh, Armies on Parade has been happening, but uh, every year except for, for the year of COVID, um, you always would do this at a Warhammer store. You would take your display board uh, that would be normally no greater than uh, two feet by two feet, which would normally be one of those realms of battle boards. Um, I know they did change up the size a little bit this year uh, to make one of those longer. I think it was 30 by 20 yeah. feet, 20, 20 inches. 22, I think, yeah. Yeah, it was something like that. So they they changed the rules, but just traditionally, uh, it's usually two feet by two feet or 24 inches by 24 inches. And you would normally take your display board into a Warhammer Games Workshop store. And at a, lo a very local level, the store manager would uh, would would allow some voting so you know the community would come into that store and would vote on their favorite armies and i think they've got a couple of characters you know best 40k best sigma best other so if you're a blood bowler or like a, a necromunda person you could do that uh and then we've got like a, a first timer or under 12s or some type of youth youth competition as well so normally it is a uh a face to face type of thing but this year because of covid because uh getting lots of people into a shop in some countries not at all you know things are shut down uh it was an online competition so and maybe that's going to be a question i want to ask for you as well is like how did you adapt given that um i know when i initially started my armies on parade board i was focused very much on the present physical mm -hmm element and um and, and and kind of getting those eyes onto my board and i did some things that maybe didn't work as well on photo but i know in real life um it certainly was um it, it was executed awesomely so uh, uh, yeah yeah it's 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 kind of a different it's a very different approach right that that presentation when you're dealing purely with um photos right that's that is all that anyone knows about your piece you know you have to it's kind of hard to separate that because in your mind you know you've been working on this thing forever and ever and putting your you know heart and soul into it but um it makes that presentation in some ways kind of all the more important so mm. um yeah photos um photos are really it's really important to do a you know uh, a good job photographing and documenting your work so yeah and i think that's critical as well right um depending on how you play with armies on parade it could just be you painting your army really well and i've seen some people just put it like putting their army on a realms of battle board they paint very basically maybe some some generic gw terrain and it's about presenting your army um because you are more of a hobbyist then you go like my side of the fence where i've got like cutting foam and i'm pouring resin and i'm just doing absolute mental stuff with my display board. And for me, it was more of a display board competition. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of tournaments will actually do things like best painted as well as like coolest army. So yeah, um, yeah for sure. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, a different, different approach for sure. Um, but definitely there are, I think, you know, all of the winners, all the examples that were highlighted and um, have, have really different approaches. Um, and I think yours, yours and mine are, are good examples of kind of opposite ways of, of dealing with it. But yeah. So, so you know what? Let's let's maybe set the scene by actually. I'm going to share my little video because mine's like seven yeah. seconds, and cool. then yours is about thirty seconds. So let's actually show off what we submitted, and then we'll kind of discuss and understand uh, what we did, why we did it, what we would do next time, because there's a, a strong likelihood that Armies on Parade 2021 maybe online again just currently how we're kind of tracking i think it's it, i'm anticipating for that and if we happen to do face to face then happy days yeah i'm yeah. going to share my little this is my contribution guys and and, and I, we'll have photos to kind of to unpack it a little bit as well so as you can see there i had a little display board that was gargans i thought i would push the barrier by trying to do a display board and an army in less than 60 days from release so brave man yeah yeah so i was a bit crazy i i, I submitted gargants and um uh this is kits we can talk over this like ah, yeah sure sure wow. yeah, so we, 
This is, um, yeah, this piece um, was a lot of fun to work on. So this is a big, a big part of my board is this kind of storm vault idea. You know, there's a few, few GW kits that I kind of uh, broke apart and, you know, mashed together. And um, it's, uh, so this video is playing a, a GIF just kind of on a, a loop. Um, and there's a, an old iPhone kind of stuck underneath there that uh, has a battery pack and, uh, and yeah, so. It was. I was really kind of. Um, I'm, I'm interested in kind of playing with you know, uh, involving lights and tech and video if possible. You know, motors, things like that. There's just different ways of kind of, uh, you know, making that that display a little more dynamic and and interesting. So yeah, that was a that was a fun project to work on. So you learn a lot. I think I think for me, like, and I'd love to hear why you eventually did actually enter armies on parade this was at but this is both of our first times um for for me for me i have not i've enjoyed so much of the building aspect that i know uh in the chat i can see crazy horse who is an absolute you know crazy person when it comes to terrain he is uh he is in the pantheon of terrain uh he is he is the lord and savior of all all terrain <laughs> But I know for me, I'm on that side where I love creating this world and, you know, really grounding my force into more than just what's on their faces. You know, I can put down a scenic backdrop. I can do things on, on the table. I can interact with them. Um, for anyone who may have followed this channel in the past, my CanCon, um, so at CanCon 2020, I actually picked up this trophy, this Forge World trophy uh, for having one of the coolest armies there. And it was right. having like these Skaven tunneling under my city of Sigma as they kind of went out to fight. Right. And I love telling that story. And my, my, my army here was about kind of t telling a story about my ice gargants um, all raiding a little village. And for me, Armies on Parade has been all about grounding my force, practicing some new skills that I can't practice at a, a at a miniature level sure. and learning a whole bunch of things along the way. Why, why, why you, what, what got you into armies on parade and what made you finally make that leap? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, again, a lot of it kind of goes back to that just early getting that bug and, and being excited by, you know, all of those heavy metal, you know, painting guides and, and photos in the back of white dwarf and, um, but yeah, I think uh, for this for this particular you know this entry, um, I was uh, trying to do things a little bit differently as far as you know not building something that was kind of monumental and difficult to transport, something that was a little more modular because I, I you know had done you know a couple of years ago something that was much more um, just kind of massive in terms of, you know, playing with the terrain. It was, you know, lots of verticality to it. Um, this time it was, um, uh, I kind of wanted to see how I could move the pieces around and make little smaller pieces that were kind of more modular and sort of set up a scene that kind of complemented whatever, you know, army I ended up displaying. Um, and so a lot of the photos are, um, you know, there are prob I, I take a ton of photos when I when I set these things up. You know, a lot of a lot of thought goes into kind of what makes sense visually and where where should things go that that places them in a an interesting way that you know kind of moves your eye around. Um, so yeah, that that sort of modularity to some of those pieces, like that storm vault piece that you showed, um, uh, is kind of part of that. So yeah i might actually bring up some of the photos and just kind of show off a little bit so uh yeah. if you happen to have gone onto the armies on parade website uh or the warhammer community community article that kind of showed off the winners um you would see kit as one of those winners and uh you can see you've got the dread artisans award for painting and i know uh, i don't know what that award is but i know that matthew <laughs> is also very keen to hear about your art background because i think for yeah. me this is not just a painting competition it's not golden demon uh it's more than just golden demon you know you're you're mm. being judged and there's some very cool judges i saw tyler mangle was one of the judges mm. uh i can't remember who else was in the judging i know i think maybe nick Baton was in there i i responded to their tweet saying i had to bribe them for next year um, <laughs> but like, yeah. when you look at this like you can tell it's more than just painting it's composition uh you're incorporating games workshop terrain uh, as you've already mentioned, you incorporated this uh, this el electric kind of uh, imagery to kind of create that portal, that swirl. Um, 
you probably don't need to go down that length. You don't have to uh, learn electronics to do it, but you know, these are just ways that you can bring your story to life. For sure, yeah. I think, you know, in general, um, as far as and my art background, yeah, I, I did I did study drawing and painting and sculpture uh, in college and um, worked as an artist for a while. And um, definitely some of the just compositional kind of elements, looking at 2D and 3D design and kind of just keeping in mind how the viewer's eye is kind of being directed, um, it is definitely helpful. Those those kinds of skills are, are definitely applicable. but you know, this kind of thing does not require an art background by any means, you know. Um, I've, I've kind of had a, a style that I've been comfortable with and that I, I like doing and it makes sense to me and uh, feels good, you know, as far as painting and terrain building. But, um, you know, it is definitely not the only way to, uh, to do it. Um, you know, the, um, as far as the painting itself, I, um, I definitely have kind of a limited palette um, by by design. Um, I think that that, you know, putting some restraints on or constraints on on the palette, which colors, how many paints I use um, in a weird way kind of makes me a, a little more creative in terms of mixing paints, um, coming up with different kind of um, color combinations, things like that. So, you know, for example, like I guess on the, the Grim Gas Reapers on the left side there, um, you know, looking at their their kind of cloaks and how um, they, they contrast with each other. So there's kind of this bright gold non-metallic metal, but um, overall the pieces are actually quite quite dark. You know, it's mm -hmm. all from a basically a black undercoat, um, which kind of gives me uh, I feel a little bit more contrast, which is just kind of the the way I like to paint, um, and that I'm comfortable painting. So. Um, yeah, just kind of keeping in mind general sort of color combinations and shapes. And, you know, I found that um, a good trick is, you know, as you're working, if you're looking at a either a unit like this or a terrain piece or your display board, you know, if you can squint your eyes and just kind of look at the general shapes and values. And um, if, if that is interesting, if the whole composition is interesting just by getting rid of the details, really just looking at basic kind of building blocks, um, then you're you're kind of on the right path, and that's that's kind of uh, definitely kind of an art sort of thing. Um, but it's it's served me well. It's um, a handy thing to do. And I think I think this year, uh, being again being an online competition, and who knows, once COVID's over, uh, maybe the online element will stay. Uh, we don't know. Obviously, they might want to bring back the local level stuff, but maybe there will be an opportunity to compete at at an international level. I think it was exciting to be able to see all of the cool hobby that was happening in other countries that I would never see. You know, I might pop down yeah. to my game workshop and see what's happening locally, but I don't get a lot of visibility that's happening at a grander scale. And I hope that they continue to put focus because I'd love to see not just you guys who won, but also maybe that next tier of who was really good, maybe shortlisted, but maybe didn't uh, win because the, totally. the, yeah. the level of hobby, the level of creativity, uh, the level of inspiration is just uh, uncanny. But you mentioned something that I was really interested in, and that was because we were doing an online competition, composition is probably more important than it ever was before. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of took me back to when I did photography at uh, high school, you know, thinking about foreground, middle ground, background, thinking about my my nine quadrant squares when I think about a photo and thinking about how do I not just take photos of my army or not just put them on a display board, but how do I make it visually appealing so that it's all interesting? And I think maybe that was the maybe the challenge I didn't quite get to uh, in, in such a rush, but talk to me about composition. Talk to me about, about how you use that to plan and execute on your board. Yeah, totally. It's, it's a great question. I mean, it, you know, presentation is, is everything. Um, I mean, you can be the best painter in the world and if your photos are not well done or, um, you know, you, you, even just the arrangement is not really captivating. You can really cut yourself off at the knees very easily. So, um, you know, I guess in general, um, there are maybe if, um, I don't know, Anthony, if you can, can you go back a few, um, to that overall shot of the board? Yeah. So this is maybe a good example on the right, on the right side. It's kind of the overall 
photo. Um, you know, I think for this one, I, this was one of my favorites just from that, those photos that I submitted um, because I think that it flows really well, you know? So, you know, in this photo, I was real cognizant of, if you kind of look on the right side, the sort of tippy top of where that obelisk ends, um, and then gradually kind of going downward to the left um, part of the frame, you know, you hit sort of Neferata's top of her weapon there. Mm. And it kind of naturally slopes down to where the, you know, the, the Knight of Shrouds is placed and his, his sword is kind of held up there and then down to the mausoleum and then actually all the way down to kind of where the Guardian of Souls is. It's sort of cut off in this photo, but it's also kind of pointing in that, that same direction. So it was kind of, you know, this sort of big piece, that Storm Vault piece right in the middle, but I think your eye has a chance to sort of go to different paths and it kind of gradually, you know, um, draws it around in a circle. So there's always different things to kind of look at and it's not just all, you know, in your face spread mm. out equally, right? It's kind of um, heavily weighted toward the front, but it keeps, you know, kind of going back in terms of elevation as well. So I think those those kinds of things are, you know, like you said, with an online only competition, those are huge. Um, and those are things that um, uh, they're a little harder to define, um, you know, in terms of what makes a good, you know, composition. But, uh, but yeah, I think uh, lots of photographs along the way are, are always helpful. And, and I wanted to bring up my, the reason I just changed screens is I wanted yeah. to bring up my, uh, we've got a whole bunch of photos guys to kind of walk through the process of going from start to finish because, you know, it, it, Kit just didn't wake up one day and and have a, an amazing board. You start off with a plan. You know, I know people like Dave um, Dave Griffin uh, from Nashcon will do a whole bunch of design and he'll draw it up on like a like a computer program or you know you draw it out on a on a piece of paper and you go through refining. Um, for me, I tried to do that type of composition, but the other way, I tried to do an elevate kind of work off a hill mm -hmm. and. Knowing that I had gargans, knowing I had these big these structures, I was really concerned about having just one flat eye level, just everything right. kind of same, same. Mm -hmm. So I tried to elevate using a backdrop of uh, a sloping hill and then a little bit of like a, a, a wall. So um, I guess just going off what you said around composition, that's how I was thinking about things. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing what you just said about the pillar, Neferata, uh, going into the Night of Shrouds and then into the little mausoleum, um, I can see how you brought a design element to the eye. And like if I was to, I was thinking about what if I moved Neferata and let's say the Night of Shrouds, if I just kind of swapped them, their placement on the board, mm -hmm. I could see that it wouldn't flow right. as much as the way you've got it. So even just simply the positioning of the models and where you put things um, can absolutely change um as you go and funnily enough i probably will go into the you know a question from one two two three 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 four 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 it's like how much did the design of your it rolls right off the tongue i like that it's just absolutely natural it's probably on, on the driver's license <laughs> but like and i think that's probably like a really important question is mm -hmm. at least for me the the design that i started with in my journey was not what I executed on. It evolved yep. a lot. Uh, some ideas I completely ditched, some ideas I built upon. And um, I wanna go back to, the, I love this skull. But um, <laughs> you know, like, you, you know, you change, you, you iterate, you you see things and they don't mm -hmm. work as well or some things work really well and you're like, I wanna build upon it more. How much did yours change? How did, how did your design change? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So yeah, quite a bit. Um, you know, I think that part of um, and this, you know, in years past, you know, um, definitely, I would be I would end up finding myself getting frustrated if the, uh, you know, the finished product didn't really match what my initial idea was, or my first kind of drawings or sketches were. But, you know, I've realized that's, that's part of the process, right. And that's actually where a lot of the, the fun and the the some of the most interesting things can come about are sort of those those kind of accidents um, that you stumble upon. So, yeah, you're right. It's um, you do iterate a lot, and I think especially when you're dealing with something that is um, so complex as and, and involves so many different materials as a display board, um, 
yeah, it's bound to evolve. Uh, I, mean, I think it kind of should, right? If you're doing it, if you're doing it right. Um, so yeah, this this piece, um, you know, this by itself, this one kind of evolved a bit. Um, you know, I knew that uh, I wanted to use this kind of video component. Um, I wasn't exactly sure how it would work and you know, there are definitely some practical considerations like, okay, how long is this thing gonna run <laughs> if, it, if it just goes? So there was a lot of just kind of note taking and little tests and things that I would do. Um, but yeah, it's um, trying to think, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with these kinds of materials, you do have to kind of play around with them and, and adjust your course. Um, and kind of you know go back to the drawing board throughout the whole process. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a complex kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. Was there anything that um, this one in particular? Um, anything that jumps out at me? You know, there was the so if you go back to that um, the overall picture, it has that mausoleum on top. Um, that was something that was completely like a this thing was 90% done and then that was a decision that I made. So it's actually uh, magnetized there with that Garden of Moore piece um, that it can plop right on that area or, you know, like in those other photos, it can be taken off and um, it's a little more kind of game friendly in that in that way if it were to be used that way. So, Well, yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because Travis Griffin has mentioned, and, I, and this was a big consideration for myself was, Mm -hmm. Did the building of the board in the modular aspect allow you to try setting up everything in a different way? Um, like, how did that kind of come about? And I know for me, um, mm -hmm. I'll answer because when I was approaching Armies on Parade, uh, Australia is, I'm very fortunate to have tournaments running. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have CanCon running 2021, which will be happening, should it, should be happening in three weeks from now. Uh, but I did have the pleasure of having a, uh, a local tournament, a 40-player tournament, um, on the same day, actually, funnily enough, as Armies on Parade. And I know that Gargans want to be my army, so I can still have the opportunity to take my display board mm -hmm. and take it to face-to-face -face tournaments, at least in Australia. So for me, transport, modularity was very important. Yeah. But I know that with some countries either not able to have events or maybe people not feeling comfortable to go to events, you don't have to think about that. You could do something crazy, I think, Mm -hmm. um, that community piece that won uh, the Community Spirit Award, which is just, you know, this massive yeah. Yeah. Necro necromunda kind of um, underhive. Right. You can't transport that. <laughs> you can't take it on a plane. Yeah. You probably have to hire a truck to take that to an event. Like, it's just, it's too big to transport. Right. So I think right. maybe the question I've got for you is how important was the modularity? How did that come into your design? Yeah. And, like, what was your thinking there? Totally. It, so it was, that was really the the impetus behind this one you know so the previous board that i built was very not modular and just like you said you know it was a total pain in the ass to transport um it you know i with this one i like um i like that it can kind of change and evolve you know it may be the kind of thing that i i reuse or add new things to or take things away from um so i kind of like how this one can is a little more flexible in in terms of not only you know just physical constraints um, transporting, but um, also just um, can be you know totally reinvented. Um, so you know like the the you know individual pieces that are there that obelisk that skull um, that uh, storm vault piece, you know all of those things can come right off. Um, or be rearranged. And so, yeah, a lot of the consideration as far as, you know, again, we're talking about photographing and composition documenting. I mean, there are probably 200 photos that I took just of completely different, different combinations of these things. So, um, so yeah, it, it was very intentional um, in this case. And I may, I may, for future Armies on Parade, I may go back to that very non-modular kind of monolithic um, type of board. Um, but for this one, I was definitely all about kind of just flexibility. So just different approaches. So. And, I, and I like that because there are some display boards that I've seen that I look, they look amazing. And what they can do is you can cut out parts of the board mm -hmm. and have your model at the, the base level. So the, the base of your model 
is flat to the board and it really does allow you to blend into the board but then what it does is it also makes it redundant if you ever try to change your army or it forces you down a certain route so there's pros and cons i guess when you're in the design process of what this board's going to be is it going to be a tournament board that i'm going to use over and over is it a one shot is it purely for display is it something in between and i think for me that kind of led that was like my starting umbrella that led me through my design process and um it, yeah i think that was for me that was really important yeah, um i think for me as well like one big lesson i learned was um on my gargant bases and I, i'll see if i've got a photo mm -hmm. uh, uh, by the way, that was me. That was me hacking into mine and having my my little smoke machine. So I had like a, and this is important because I I had a portable display board, so there was no power supply. It was all USB charged. Right. So if I was going to take it to a tournament, there's not going to be an electricity plug for me to plug in my motorized vape machine. Right. So I had to I had to modularize it. I had to make it self contained. So that came into my design process, but um well what was i going to say well there's no photo or is it there well you know one of the big lessons for me was um i was using games workshop um uh, crackle paint uh mm -hmm. so all of my all my gargan bases are crackle paint for 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 my gargans which is fine on a base it was like three or four pots of you know a ghrelin earth or whatever it was right how many pots is that on the foam how many pots is that on a two by two yeah that's a lot right that adds up yeah it's a lot mm -hmm. so so thinking that through and thinking about you know are there any manufacturers of crackle paint is crackle paint the best use of uh of being on the display board and how much am i willing to spend and i think for me playing with resin as well was certainly another consideration um and like how much do i want to spend on this this idea i think really thinking about what you're trying to do not going overboard i think just because kit has a, has a mobile phone creating a portal and i have a smoke machine doesn't mean it has to be about uh the biggest arms race it's right. about the execution and the quality not just having leds and smoke machines and like like dry ice and like just yeah. that's not what it has to do it's not it's totally. not an arms race yeah yeah i mean definitely you know just a well executed painted board is i mean th that is where that's where it's at i mean you know all the the bells and whistles and flashy things are great if they add to the piece but they can also really easily take away from it too if it's not if it's not done well so and that's important is that anything that you introduce to your board should be complementary not draw you away so if it's if it's too strong of a focus then one it ruins the composition on the photo it draws your eye to a certain part of the photo right. but then two uh it also then um can highlight certain things that maybe you don't want highlighted or people aren't looking at things you know and like for me like i got a picture of johan there running up the, the <laughs> middle of a pin. Yeah. i put him center of the board and i had gargants kind of chasing him but i didn't want him to be the focus the focus i need mm. to have elements all over the board right. um so it's like like what would you do is there, is there anything you do differently next year like now that you've kind of gone through this process and um yeah i think um you know i don't know if i would be quite as um you know i'm, I'm pretty meticulous with my painting i'm definitely more of a, a quality over quantity kind of painter um and really into kind of making a force that looks cohesive and nice together. Um, I think I realized though that through doing these more modular pieces that sort of complement the army, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a paramount importance to have everything just be so cohesive. You know, you can have certain things that draw the eye to an extent, you know, within boundary. Um, and you can have areas that are less, um, you know, that don't stand out as much. And I think you kind of need both of those things. But I'd say maybe, um, maybe going, you know, Armies on Parade is a great chance to kind of go nuts with things too and try new things like you mentioned, uh, new materials or new, you know, painting techniques or whatnot. 
um, yeah, like your your resin bathtub here. Like, like, um, wow! Did, did I learn a whole bunch of things <laughs> playing with resin? So, uh, I mentioned this year I won uh, one of the coolest armies uh, at CanCon. CanCon has two hundred and forty odd players, so I was honoured uh, to to get a placing in that. Awesome. And I had played with resin. I played with resin on my old display board, my City of Sigma, you know, marching marching city, and I had like a little pond, and it worked really well but I had never played with this much resin. Yeah. And I think for me, it's also an opportunity to try things. Um, I bought myself a heat gun and I started playing with foam and, and heating it. Uh, you know, last year I used a hot wire cutter to kind of cut through the foam, but I was able to blend things over um, with a heat gun. Uh, playing with this much resin and having to find myself, you know, some type of, ceramic or some type of um of way to kind of box it all in mm -hmm. i learned so much with this i thought i did a good job plugging the gaps with the resin and i didn't <laughs> uh i also i i also I, I i was really smart i thought to myself i'm going to buy some special resin that is deep pour so i could pour larger layers than i normally thought i could mm -hmm. so i forgot mm -hmm. that I then forgot that I bought the special resin. Okay. So I then made it harder on myself mm -hmm. as I built up the layers of resin to keep the colors consistent. So, um, but, I'm, but I'm okay with it. Like I learned so much through the process that yeah. makes me a better hobbyist. And last year when I played with resin, I found it really hard to get rid of bubbles. Because, you know, when, when you're doing with resin on bases or resin things, bubbles mm -hmm. start to appear. And I found it a little bit challenging at the time to get rid of those bubbles. This year, no bubbles. Despite this, despite the amount of resin I used, I got rid of it. So if I ever did a deepkin army and I wanted to have like water on the base, mm -hmm. I'm now really confident I know how to do that. I know how to do it well. I know how to do waves. I know how to do, um, to do splashes. So I know how to use glass beads to, to make little waves if I wanted to. Nice. Um, I know how to make sure that the resin looks clean and crisp because I went through this process. And I think for me, Armies on Parade is much as a personal learning journey than it is a competition. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's, um, you know, that just kind of got me thinking about, you know, developing a certain amount of comfort with with different tools. You know, I'm uh, power tools, not, nothing real exotic, but, you know, things like jigsaws, grinders, sanders, I mean, that, that can go a long way in terms of your presentation and your overall, um, just even things that you consider when you're thinking about um, making a board. Um, so yeah, that can that can really open open things up. So I think like you with this resin, I mean, yeah, that um, <laughs> I can imagine finding out your, your gaps were not completely closed was uh, uh, something that you learned quickly. Yeah, and the interesting thing that uh, so I, I I did really good gap closing on the sides, right? So I had the, I had an acrylic board under the side, and then I kind of boxed it in with the side, uh, which worked perfectly. It was it was great. I didn't get any leaks. The challenge is when resin leaks because resin heats up to dry. So the way the way resin cures is it heats up. Mm. If you poured resin on foam, for example, uh, it would eat through the foam. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did was I put on a layer, and I think it was um, Travis mentioning earlier. He used coffee grounds. That's mm -hmm. I, I use coffee grounds and rocks as the base of my um, of my my river because I wanted that layer between the foam and the resin. So right. the rocks and and, that, and then obviously I put PVA glue. And actually I used um. Uh, not PVA glue. The uh, Mod Podge. I used Mod Podge as a seal to kind of again create another layer. Right. So it doesn't eat through the resin. Now, the challenge that I found was that uh, while I sealed all the gaps over with the with, and I boxed it in really well, I failed that the under the undersurface. So uh -huh. resin started to seep underneath and actually rise the board up a little bit, which then meant resin slowly was creeping towards the back. And this overall one leaking out the back, so almost going into my carpet if I didn't catch it. But more importantly, it meant that it was becoming hard to contain the the, the resin, so I had to do multiple mm. pours. Mm. So I learned so much through that process that I'm now better for it. And I think that's the opportunity that I'm looking at going, right, well, I tried something. It worked. It also didn't work. What can I do in future?
Totally, totally. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just as far as talking about these boards, you know, the materials that, that people can use are, you do not need to do exotic type things. You don't need expensive, you don't have to buy a whole slew of new GW kits. And, you know, um, you know, my board, the texture on it is sand from the hardware store. I mean, I, it's like a 50 pound bag, I think it costs $5. Um, I mean, this stuff is not not pricey. This skull is, you know, a plastic thing from a Halloween store uh, that I bought a few years ago. I mean, so a lot of this stuff is not uh, super duper exotic. It doesn't have to break the bank either. Um, but it, um, yeah, I think it, uh, like you said, it's just kind of a a chance to go as crazy as you would like, or to just practice new skills. Or, um, uh, but yeah, it's it's a great thing to do. I think Army on Parade is pretty pretty great in terms of just getting a lot of people together who are really, you know, excited about the hobby. And, um, um, yeah, it's, it was a fun thing. So it's, it's crazy to see how many people have a different perspective on the hobby and there could be 10 different, let's say deep kin boards and all 10 mm -hmm. of them would look different. All 10 legions and a gash players boards would look different because we all have our own perception yeah. and, and, and just to kind of reinforce your point, correct me if I'm wrong, that looks like cheap cork board or not cheap cork board, uh, MDF board. Like it's MDF. Board. Yeah. Yeah. It's not expensive stuff. Yeah. And, and to kind of reinforce the point here, all I've done to create my base is I've got a uh, MDF, the chipboard as a, as a base, my two by two. Mm -hmm. um, that is one sheet of foam so that you buy that from, um, from a hardware store. I know each country is different in Australia. Our insulation foam is yellow. I think in some countries it's pink, some countries it's blue. But that was twenty dollars Australian, so it's not very expensive. Um, and then obviously, I you know I, I I used an old vape machine. Funnily enough, it's just the old smoke vape machine mm -hmm. that I rewired like MacGyver. So I think that was kind of going over the top. But this doesn't have to be an expensive exercise. You can go buy a Games Workshop Realm of Battle board, which is like well, it depends on which country you're in. Just buy a two by two tile, uh, or make or start it with a little bit of uh, a chip chip board. Um, mm -hmm. from, from your hardware store. Totally, totally. So, yep. um, so let's talk about the planning process. I think, you know, we've kind of given an idea of what Armies on Parade's all about. Hopefully some people are kind of um, inspired to maybe explore explore their own journey. I can see George is very impressed here with your uh, with your phone setup, and I love this is this could be a way to recycle your 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 old iPhone. You've just yeah. upgraded to it, upgraded to a new phone, and uh, what better way to incorporate an old phone than uh, recycle it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hang on to those things or sell them to me. I'll take them. I'll use them for something. I've seen some really cool people use their phones with a realm gate and kind of done the same kind yeah. of similar, very similar yeah. technique, but having like a swirling realm gate. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I well. How Amazon Parade happens traditionally in October or November? Usually, yeah, it's around that September, October, November kind of period. But when did you start your planning process? Man, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so because this one was so modular, you know, I had worked on uh, some of the the other, the different pieces. So like the skull, well, actually it's sitting right here behind me. That skull was probably the first thing I'd done. And that was, um, I mean, that was probably a year and a half ago at this point. I, I ended up working on that. Um, and so, yeah, that the ball got rolling early on, but, you know, it's, as far as putting everything together and um, making that display board itself, you know, it probably was a few months of just kind of considering it, drawing it out, um, you know, seeing how big I wanted it to be and, um, and getting the, you know, the, the storm vault piece, the iPhone piece was, was probably the most time consuming out of all of that. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's something I just kind of chipped away at over, over the months. But um I think if I had kind of focused on it explicitly, just did that for, for a while, it, um, and maybe um, I'm always terrible at, at estimating how much time, because I never, I never finish anything in one sitting. I'm always kind of like, you know, doing things for 30 minutes at a time or an hour at a time here and there. But, um, but yeah, it was probably a several month project. And I, I guess I asked that question because uh, for anyone who's thinking about armies on parade, um, a lot of people, it appears, like I know when I'm talking to my Discord folk, um, 
like I'm, I'm trying to encourage people to get more and more into into, into armies on parade or even things like um, I know last year they had the ever chosen painting comp mm -hmm. and a lot of people have the idea of doing it and then they find as you get closer to the deadline that you haven't you're not close to submission and uh, or you lose motivation through the process so it's good to hear maybe how you started your journey and maybe for people at home you might find this valuable is that I'm already planning my Armies on Parade 2021 board. I've okay. chosen my army. So if anyone's heard me talking about Daughters of Cain, Daughters of Cain is my army. Um, while I'm playing with my Sons of Behemoth, my Gargans for the competitive tournament year, my, uh, my, my Armies on Parade board will be a dock board. So I've given myself 11 months approximately to do it. And I think that was probably one of the biggest lessons that I found in this year was doing a son's army as aspirational as it was to do a gargant board i had to get the models had to build them had to paint them i had to build the, the board i had to design the board that was a lot in 60 days and yeah. um and sourcing the kits this year were really hard i uh one man crushes have been out i i, I wanted to get I, I tried to buy some man crushes before covid hit and they've been out in australia since like march Mm. Um, and I couldn't get a hands on them. I even tried to get secondhand ones. So for me, and then I, I pulled to, from Rohan. The challenge that I had was that I, m the vision that I had was that well, one of my Gargans raiding. I didn't want. I don't. I didn't want it to be my Gargans home. I wanted to be my Gargans were attacking. They were raiding. They were trying to get some food, and that was a story I wanted to tell. Mm. Age of Stigma doesn't have those houses. Yeah, you can't buy a house. There's no house. There's no house in Age of Sigma. Yeah, so. So either I had to change my plan or I had to go into a whole different thing. And I think there was a question from Crazy Horse around terrain and it talked about like, how does GWC terrain? At the moment, based on the rules, it says that you have to be using most of your pieces from your game system. And I think that might have that might have hindered me. I would love some feedback if anyone from Games Workshop's listening to this, is that I use kits from Rohan. And I know there's some legality between Games Workshop and New Line Cinema. And I wonder, not that I think that I would have won Armies on Parade, but getting a bit more clarity on mixing kits. Um, I'm sure they're a bit linear with 40K and Sigma versus Sigma and Middle right. Earth. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. Also, kind of similarly, um, uh, that got me thinking about kind of discontinued kits as well. So, I yeah. mean... You know, I've been I've been crazy about kind of scouring eBay for I don't know. Do you remember these older? Um, I think they came around in like the uh, twenty early teens. Yeah, so like the the oh, I always forget the name. Dread. I've been trying to get that temple for a long time. Yeah, 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 right. Uh, were, yeah, those were great. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I got my hands on one of them, uh, the the Death Knell watch, which is a great just little kind of tower um, that I'd like to use. So. But yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, mixing mixing kits and how they kind of feel about that. Because I know um, Games Workshop, uh, because it's their competition, right? And I don't blame them for the wanting you to to use product in their household. Right. Um, I know for them, um, when I did my CanCon board, um, it was never going to be an Armies on Parade board, which meant that I could 3D print terrain. I could 3D print mm. roads. I could 3D print castles. I could do whatever I want. And... Um, uh, going into armies on parade, I can't do that because the, uh, the the idea is either you use kits from their own line or it's ham sculpted. So uh, they don't want you 3D printing. I don't know how keen of an eye, but basically I didn't want to put in all this work to be technically excluded because of a 3D printed piece. So I played it safe. Um but for me, I think, you know, 3D printing, it meant that I kind of had to scale back. I couldn't use, I couldn't do that thing. But if I was just doing this for a uh, a tournament and I wasn't entering armies on parade, obviously that would not have to worry unless it was a GW tournament. For sure. Yeah, there is, that's that's always the the backdrop. You have to know, you know, whose house you're uh, <laughs> you're playing in, right? So same thing with, you know, Golden Demon, of course, and, and all of their kind of sponsored competitions. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's a very important kind of practical consideration when entering. it's a logistics right? like, like if you're planning if you're planning at a board and uh in your plan you know uh george uh, said it's a dread hold and yeah you know the dread the dread hold the witch fate tour if your mm -hmm. idea is based on a, a kit that is out of print 
Um, one, you've got to source that. So how much money are you willing to spend? Two, how easy is it you, for you to, to kind of source it? Mm -hmm. um, I know for me in my board, um, uh, I might bring this photo back up for a second, but you can see here, you can see here that I've got all these little fishies. All of yeah. those fishies are from the bases of like the Eidolons of Mathland. And ah, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, do you know how hard it is to source one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve? Probably about twenty different little fishies off people's boards. It's not easy. It's a lot. Yeah, it's not easy. So, I think for planning, as you said, like sourcing your materials, mm. um, is is important to understand how hard it is going to be. And if you are going to source some materials, do it early. Right. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, no, it's. So you started you started planning your board a year, two years, maybe half half a year, depending yeah. on like what draw, I think maybe Something that like kind of that. determines how much effort or how much time. Um, you know, the, obviously the the earlier you start planning, the less time you need to invest because I could right. I could invest an hour or two hours a week, mm -hmm. but if I was starting my display board like I was for this year, I reckon I was doing an hour or two a night. I was mm -hmm. just straight up two hours of hobby every day just to get it to a, a level I was happy with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty good clip. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little uh, odd, I guess, in the sense that, you know, I had the advantage of uh, the the army itself, you know, the models, I these were all done, right? I mean, I was not racing to paint the army as well as, you know, finish out the board. Those were, those were kind of separate um, separate sort of considerations. So um, if you are doing all of it at once and starting a whole new army project, like a lot of people do, that's great. But yeah, just be aware, as, as you said, um, don't want to, you know, bite off more than you can chew, so to speak. So, yeah. Talk to me how different this, this board looked in your mind when you very first started compared to what you, what you end up submitting. Um, is it close? Did you have like obviously you know Manfred was for example was in the white dwarf that you we showed off a little earlier but here is Neferata, so yeah 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 it's a good question so yeah with that with that kit actually in particular um, so all the riders are magnetized of course so I you know that was an easy kind of swap um, just finishing out Neferata but um, yeah overall I think the board looked in general terms it looked it looked fairly similar but it you know like we we're saying things things definitely change and you have to adapt um you know the nice thing about well i guess the blessing and the curse of the modularity of this board was you know it didn't all come together until kind of the end you know when i was actually photographing it and getting it ready to to send off um so there was a lot of lot of maneuvering and switching things around and seeing what you know really didn't work very well in terms of um, just composition, um, and then finally landing on something that that I think did work well. So um, so yeah, I think it's um, it's one of those things that it was constantly. And I think I don't know how you feel about this. Maybe you do the same thing, but sort of constantly going back and forth between. You know what you're what you're working on and what your initial idea was, and kind of adapting the two, you know, and, and meeting in the middle somewhere, maybe. Um, yeah, that, no. it's it's dangerous. You don't want to get too precious about that initial idea because then you can kind of, you know, it's not very. Then you just, you know, just are working on a. <laughs> then it's a job, right? You know, you want to kind of have leave some room for those the moments of inspiration, I guess. So something that I, I did, and I don't know how you feel about this, uh, because Armies on Parade is something that people kind of keep secret. Uh, not a lot of people like sharing their photos until the very end because they don't want people to steal your ideas or do it better. Uh, but one thing I did was I in my Discord, um, I would share progress photos. And being it was an online competition, I knew I had to take photos. I was constantly taking photos and seeing what the composition looked like in, in each phase of the build. And by sharing some of those photos in Discord in a very uh, restricted space, uh, I could get some feedback in the moment where people thought they liked this, they didn't like this, what about this? And getting some ideas from trusted people, whether it's uh, someone who's done it before. You know, I spoke to Martin Orlando uh, on the channel a good six months ago, and we did a video about uh, presenting your army. 
I would chat to Martin kind of privately, go, hey, Martin, this is what I'm thinking. Here's some ideas. What are your thoughts? And um, and socialising for me became very important to kind of, as like a sense check, mm -hmm. because this was my intention, but is it perceived the way I'm trying to perceive it? Right. And um, and yeah. it was good to get feedback constantly as opposed to getting feedback at the very end and it's too late for me to fix. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a smart way of doing it. You know, kind of controlled feedback, you know, maybe not unleashing it, you know, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, but, you know, in a more controlled environment and, yeah, seeing how things are being perceived by the, the viewer because, you know, we can just fall in love with what we're working on and, and kind of be a little bit myopic about it. But, you know, yeah, getting getting other eyes on it and feedback is is huge. So, yeah. So how did you, and I, I know this was really important to me, was to tell a story. I think that's probably one thing that I'm, I'm very passionate about is to make sure that my board tells a story. How did you, how did you get the inspiration for this board? Like, how did you find this design? Did you find it from a story in Black Library? Is it something that you just kind of mashed together? Uh, like, what were your inspiration sources and, and how did you, like, and maybe kind of thinking about the following year is how are you finding inspiration for your next Armies on Parade board? Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so I'm not I'm not quite as up on all of the, the lore and the fiction as, um, as maybe I'd like to be. But yeah, I definitely, you know, for that Storm Vault piece, that was very much from the, you know, that Forbidden Power expansion and kind of when they moved the narrative forward. Um, I guess it was Lady Ollander kind of opened up the Storm Vault and Catacros was inside of it. And so that was very much the, the kind of inspiration for, for this piece. So um, I, I do think, well, and yeah, there was a great um, Neferata audiobook that I, I kind of chipped away at and just listened to while I was working out. And it's, it's great. It's super fun. It's super nerdy and it's, <laughs> it's great. Um, so yeah, those, the Black Library novels are, are really, and the audiobooks are, I mean, if you're kind of at a, an impasse or a little stuck and, you know, maybe have some, uh, need some inspiration, that, that's a great place to look for it. So, um, you know, I think in general, um, the models themselves are so dynamic and so crazy, especially the Night Hunt range, you know, I just, I could paint these things forever, I feel like. Um, they're just so dynamic and they do kind of tell a story on their own. So, you know, in some ways that makes things easier in terms of, um, you know, we have this great baseline to work with. Um, but yeah, I think it's definitely, it's some combination of, of um, reading and audiobooks and definitely looking at what other people are doing, right? I mean, that's that's probably the single biggest thing is just being on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, you know, um, looking at all the great, you know, photos and artwork that, that uh, Games Workshop puts out. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's super inspiring stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah, so. I know my CanCon board was uh, was inspired a lot by Chris Peach's um, Hello Heart when he yeah. is his he did his Cities of Sigma before we even had a book before Cities of Sigma had a book Chris Peach had done his own little kind of free city and cut up the uh, the Dominion kind of kit to create this amazing little city and backdrop and I know for me. Uh, when I looked at that Chris Peach piece of work, I thought to myself, what does my version look like? What does my City of Sigma, when they're leaving for battle, when they're defending their, their home, what does that look like and who and what and how? And that became my true north. That became everything that I did was trying to tell the story of my city. And, and as I think about my Armies on Parade board for 2021, I've got this Daughters of Cain idea. It is my, uh, I've actually got an amazing reference that uh, I've drawn from real life, but I'm AOSifying it. So I'm trying to find, and I don't want to ruin it. I want to tell you guys what it is. Uh, you'll steal my idea. It's better. It's, it's, it's the best idea since sliced bread. No one, no. Uh, but if you're on the Discord, you might see some, some, some hints coming from me. But I have this idea from real life and I'm like, I'm going to daughter, Daughters of Canafire, and that's what I want. I, I, I want my version of that. And then everything that I do, every mistake, every kit, every positioning is I'm anchored to that point because I'm trying to tell that story. And I think that's what's helped me a lot. 
Um, and every mistake that I make, I, I, I incorporate as a learning because I'm trying to push myself forward to that story. Right. Totally. Yeah. No, it's super helpful to have a, you know, if there's one uh, maybe, I guess, piece of advice I would give to people for armies on parade, especially is, you know, doing things to, um, and we kind of touched on this, that uh, don't, don't kind of pull out all the stops. Don't try to do everything at once because it muddies the waters. It's so much better to kind of have a real cohesive, um, concise looking board that really just complements your army and tells that piece of the story. It doesn't have to tell the whole story, you know, but um, just a really nice kind of well executed piece of what your army is doing, I think is a good, a good approach. And like you're saying that that's kind of your, your compass, you know, your true north, it sort of informs the whole process and, and how you go about working on it. So yeah. I, I, think, I think it's a nice reference point to think, why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. Like, could I incorporate LEDs? Absolutely. Could I incorporate dry, uh, dry ice? Yes. Could I in incorporate a phone on my board? Yes. But why am I doing it? Right. And how is that helping me tell my story? Um, uh, I, I, so, you know, a bit of a spoiler alert. Before I did my Gargan board and when Gargans got announced, you know, it was obviously a bit sketchy on when they would come out. So I, so my initial Armies on Parade board for 2020 was not Giants. It was going to be a squeak board and I was going to do inside a squeak cave. Um, and I knew it was going to be dark. And, and especially if I took this board to a store where I'm not going to be able to um, manipulate light myself, like it's in an in, it's indoors. So how do I how do I manipulate that story? Well, I was going to use uh, resin and LED lights through crystals to mm -hmm. illuminate my board while continuing to tell a story of being a dark, dank cave. Right. But does that also then mean that I need to have running water from a fish tank or have you know ten different things? Well, no, doesn't. But 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 is there something that's simple and easy that can enhance my story? And I did a lot of research on YouTube, and I think for me, the the greatest inspirations I've been getting from lately is not from Warhammer; it's from Railroad. Yeah. Those Railroad guys know their stuff. Yeah, they do. Oh, yeah. Like it's just off the charts what they do to to create, even just like having leaves in the water. To to because they're very realistic, you know. They they don't do a lot of fantasy boards, but looking at that, going well, how do how do I take that idea and bring that into Sigma? And I think that's where I've gotten the most joy is looking at other communities and going right, that's a cool idea. How do I AOSify it? Right, totally, totally, and yeah, that's I'm I'm totally on board with with that. I totally agree. You know, it's uh, that that finding that skull in the Halloween store was like, oh yeah, this is this is terrain. I mean, this is AOS like <laughs> writ large. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of inspiration from different areas that uh, you're right would. Uh, what? Well, well, I was talking to Rob Hawkins, who is uh, a very famous. Um, he loves his death. You know, he's, he's yeah. an absolute god in this space. Sure. And going to stores that sell Halloween products and going there straight after Halloween when they want to get rid of that stuff, yeah. there is yeah. skulls galore. You yeah. can pick up some super cheap product mm -hmm. um, at the right time or just looking at these seasonal things, whether it's Christmas to get uh, – I've seen some really cool things where people have gone to get those little – uh, Christmas trees and then kind of strip some of the snow off it oh, yeah, to incorporate yeah. a diorama. Um, so again, I think it's kind of why like planning it out and kind of getting getting a head start as early as possible allows you to tap into so many opportunities um, and 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 explore things and and try to look at things and um, do your research and take advantage of these seasonal things too. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Rob Hawkins, man, he is he is uh, yeah is on another level in terms of terrain building and yeah super inspiring but uh, the creativity he has is off the charts and yeah. i think it, it, if anyone's looking for like the inspiration on how to do things uh, i would highly go recommend go check out rob um mm -hmm. he recently just done this really cool tomb where he cut up the staircase from the obr uh bone type nexus yeah. but then incorporate that into like a hill face but then had a bit of like the sigmarite mausoleum as like a door it's just like yeah. That is a backdrop. If I think about like an undead force coming out of a tomb uh, or being awoken by Nagash and they're coming out of their crypts or they're coming out of, you know, um, 
uh, like a cemetery, for example, you know, having a really cool dark cemetery, you could do some crazy stuff with just with just foam uh, and and the mausoleum, the, the Sigmarite mausoleum kit. Um, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he's also such a master of of incorporating those pieces, but not um, letting them do all of the heavy lifting. You know, he, he is. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, it's great. And the cool thing is, you know, you can integrate old miniatures and I was going to be very cheeky with this. I almost took advantage of this. Because one of the challenges I had with my army was that if a Gargan army was going to go raid a city, then I need people to raid. Mm -hmm. So where are my people coming from? I didn't want to use cities as Sigmar kits. I was going to, I was almost going to use my Mordheim warbands, and I'd gone and found some. I'd found like someone sold me like thirty of the old Empire militia, and I was oh. going to incorporate them into the board, but I just ran out of time. But there are cheeky little ways that you can because because the rules technically are a Warhammer Games Workshop Citadel model. Yeah. So that means if you go find like a an old I don't know an old Bloodthirster and you want it as a statue, do it. Mm -hmm. it's, right. It it doesn't say it has to be a current line. You can incorporate and give, give little nods to your old miniatures, your old army, something that maybe you don't run anymore, but you wanna you still wanna display. So totally. Totally. Yeah. Statue. That that's a great way to do it, actually, especially with some of those older, kind of more static metal models. I mean, yeah, that's that's perfect for that kind of thing. I I have been looking at some of the old avatars of Kane from uh from yeah. 40k, but like, yeah. right. I, think, I think I can convert. But like what 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 have you learned to like along the way? Like is there anything that you maybe messed up with or maybe any big mistakes that um like you went down a path or a rabbit hole and you just went, whoa, this is not working for me. I need to kind of rein myself back. Or uh, was there any any times like that where maybe even like electronics with your mobile phone wasn't working properly? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, some of it just has to do with, it's more kind of attitude, I think, about the process and being really kind of being open to, adjusting your process as you're working on something and uh, not being too precious about your initial idea. Um, that's, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. I mean, the, that phone piece. Um, yeah, I, I did not know exactly how that was ultimately going to work. I, I, you know, you have an idea like that in your head and it seems like, Oh no, of course it would, you know, no big deal. And I know the dimensions and I, I know I can play a GIF and it, it can work like this. But then when you're actually, trying to mount this thing underneath a miniature, you know, it's like, it's, it gets tricky very quickly. So just kind of being open, open to that and cognizant of, um, you know, I need to, you need to kind of kill your darling sometimes and don't be too, too enamored with your initial idea because, um, you know, that's, that's, you gotta leave some room for, uh, for fun and playing and creativity, so. Yeah, more of a. I think that's kind of a constant lesson. I guess I'm I'm learning in the hobby. I don't know how you feel about. Yeah, about yeah that. no, I I agree. I was always A B testing, like just like I try, do something, yeah. test it, and either iterate or move forward or mm -hmm. bin it. Um, there were some things that I binned or some ideas that I wanted to incorporate that just didn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I tried some things, so I looked at some of the ways that 40k, for example, replicate fire. And they use like a tea like candle with um, uh, with some like cotton wool, and they and either they dye it or they paint yeah, it some yeah. way. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't like the way that it looked on my board, so I, I thought it looked, looked, looked a bit too stagnant for me. So yeah. I killed that idea, and I tried uh, the the smoke machine. Um, but then you know when I did the smoke machine for the first time, the vape. Because I had to, I had to retrofit a vape machine. It's like a real vapor, and w anyone who smokes with a vape machine knows you've got to put pull down and press something for a few seconds to allow the vape juices to come out. Mm. But if I'm doing that from afar or it's incorporated into the board, how do you do it? So it was like retrofitting it with some, you know, some um, like a little little remote control button. Uh, but then the power the power bank that I used at the time had a kill switch so it would it would uh it wasn't actually feeding juice in it needed a certain kind of like uh mm -hmm. I don't know. so i had to like change my my power bank and there was a bit of to and froing um and eventually we got got to where where i needed to be but there was a lot of like i'm even just the way i put my uh i might bring up a photo again even just the way that i demonstrated the board 
above, for example, like if I bring this up, uh, so like the house, the house here, the house here, that's not how initially I had it. Mm -hmm. So um, I moved things around, took a whole bunch of photos. Uh, there was a, uh, there was a, a pier that I was initially going to use. That's from the goblin, uh, the goblin town, but that's actually not the, the pier I used in the end. So I actually got that as a donation from Adam Huey from uh, just from the community. I'm like, hey, I'm looking for something. And um, I had a whole bunch of like uh, uh, a person called Ben, ben Spinetti contributed some of the fish to me. Uh, the community was really helpful. So if you are looking for bits, ideas, um, there's a whole bunch of people like, like, you know, tap into the community. They're very, very helpful. Uh, totally. The boat there, the boat came from Gemma, Gemma Shepherd. She sent that little boat for me. So again, um, community is awesome. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, now kind of more than ever, you know, it's, it's, it's easier, but also even more important to kind of be involved with, you know, whether it's social media or whatnot, you know, just sharing ideas. It's, it's so many people are doing that stuff. It's a great resource. So. Even when you're sharing, like, for example, if I go back to this last one kit, uh, where is it? Sorry, this, this, this peer, uh, let's say like my photo right now, I share on Twitter and I'm like, Hey guys, you know, this is kind of what I'm thinking. Someone might challenge me constructively to say, Hey, have you considered X? Or, mm. hey, this would look really cool. And an idea that I'm not even thinking about, something from a range that I'm not even considering or maybe a part that I wasn't even aware of actually could be incorporated into the board that would that would just enhance it even more. So, uh, again, part of the reason why I like socialising and just um, uh, being active in that community. Totally, totally, yeah. Is there anything that you would do differently for next year? Like thinking thinking now about um, uh, 2021, 2021 and knowing that uh, it could be a online competition again. I'm anticipating it's going to be online. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I know, not that I know anything, not, not that uh, we've been told, but I'm just anticipating for something similar. Um, how would you approach it? Uh, or maybe what advice would you give people who are approaching it, given that we've spoken about composition, considering that, you know, live judging is happening on the internet? Like, how did you prepare for online judging? Is there things that you're like uh, that would get me to a higher award category or would make your life easier? Things that maybe you would incorporate into 2021? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think definitely getting comfortable with with your documentation. So how you're photographing your pieces and, you know, don't be afraid to take a ton, a ton of photos um, and go through them and see what works and what doesn't. Because sometimes, you know, with something like this, a slight change in the angle of the camera or the lighting or where, you know, you're um, I mean, that really changes the whole focus of the piece. So um, that that is huge. Presentation is huge. Um, I think in general, though, um, I'm still kind of kind of excited about the more modular type of uh, terrain building. Um, you know, I would like to go maybe push things a little further with um, maybe some more video things, some lighting uh, motors, like small DC motors. That would be something I'd like to kind of play around with. I don't quite have a specific idea just yet, but um, that would be a really kind of fun thing to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's all about just kind of being open to things and, um, and yeah, just, just playing around with things. It's a great chance to kind of push your skills, but um, I would say if there's one single thing, it would be don't try to do everything. Um, it's uh, try to do something that is, that suits and complements your particular force. Um, Cause that is going to go much further and have more impact than um, a bunch of fancy, you know, bells and whistles and things like that. It's great if it complements your army, but um, not a, something you have to do, not a prerequisite. So. Talk to me about the photography. Cause I think that's probably the one thing that caught people off guard a lot. Mm. And uh, for me, I don't own a fancy pants camera. I don't have a DSLR. Yeah. Um, uh, light boxes aren't normally the size of a two by two um, to, uh, board. So yeah. I know for me, on the day of submitting my armies on parade, I thought I would run run down quickly to the local news agency and buy some sheets of cardboard and just like try to kind of arc, uh, uh, orchestrate a light box and then kind of got some lighting on there to try yeah. to make it a little bit a little bit more professional. Uh, compared to like my little workshop backdrop, but how did you how did you 
like what came into your mind with the composition of the camera, the lighting, the the white backdrop? Like how did you do that part? Because I re- I imagine that's going to be a struggle for a lot of people. And I know yeah, Gamesworth yeah. has a little a little document of how to take right. photos of you know, miniatures, but like from your art backdrop and all of that stuff, like how did you come up with this? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. So yeah, they they do Games Workshop does have that little photo guide, which is a good uh, I think a good place to start. It's not definitely not all encompassing or anything like that, but um, you know, in general terms, a just a simplified background I think is it it goes so far. I mean, it's such a simple thing, but um, you know, you don't want to have a busy background. You don't want to have your hobby desk in the background. You know, you want to have um, yeah, like you've done here, you know, whether it's black or white, it, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is, but um, that way your eye is really encouraged to focus on on the piece itself. And so that's a simple, just practical kind of thing. Um, you know, make sure that you do have diffuse kind of lighting. Um, you don't want to do real heavy duty spotlighting or get glare on your, your miniatures. Um, and that's partially just in my case, moving the lights around actively while I'm taking photographs and looking at them, um, taking a lot of photos while I do it too, because you know you may flip between five different photos that are essentially the same composition, but you've moved the lights slightly, um, and you have a really bad glare in some of the recesses. So you know, just not being afraid to kind of scatter shot and then you know pull out the you know the select photos that that really work well. Um, you know, I, I also don't use a fancy camera. I just use my, my phone. I mean, iPhones have amazing cameras these days. Um, not a fancy setup, but it is, uh, it's worked well for me. So yeah, just moving things around, um, not getting too static with it um, and looking for the right angle. You know, I think maybe in that photo guide that GW has, I, I can't remember. I think they maybe talk about like the, the sort of golden angle or something like that with the model. I can't remember how they phrase it, but you know, you do want to make sure you showcase what you want to showcase. You know, you don't want to choose the angle that has, you know, the weapon kind of obscured behind the miniature, just kind of basic things like that. But um, yeah, I I think just practicing with that is, is really, it just kind of comes with, with, uh, with practice like anything else. Um, It's interesting. They say you don't need a fancy camera because I think, the minute people heard this was an online competition, I think some people freaked out and they're like, well, I don't own a DSLR. How on earth can I get the best photos? Mm. But to hear that you submitted your photos, and I'll go back to your army uh, in a second, but, like, you, you pick up the detail there. It's gorgeous. And um, I know in the past, and I don't know if this is still true, but I know that uh, the native uh, iPhone, for example, camera uh is always better when you use an app that isn't the native app. I know I've had like different camera apps that have given me better composition or has given me, uh, mm. maybe I, I get a tripod for example, and I could have like a slow release shutter uh, as opposed to just kind of like just stepping away. Um, so I know that that's really helped. Um, and Tribal Herbs, yes, uh, that was a smoke machine uh, used as a vape pen. Yes, I, I literally just uh, retrofitted. That's just a little vape just what you buy from the shops. Um, I have some cords kind of going into like a little air ventilator, uh, the, the air ventilator into a tube. And um, that's how I got the smoke coming out of the house. Uh, and I did that as well because I needed to obscure the tube. So knowing that from afar, if you really look, you can probably see the tube there. But, uh, mm. you know, if I could do some heavy smoke coming out at least at, uh, at one point in time, I could um, I could hide or use a trick to hide something negative. I'll yep. share another trick as well that I thought I, w- I was really clever. I was really proud of myself. Uh, late, so when I when I put up one of my armies on parade board photos on Twitter, um, one of the guys in my community, Dane or Danye, um, said to me, he goes, oh, you should put a gargan swimming in the river. And I thought that was a bit stretch, it was a bit much. But, I, but he had a good idea. He's like, well, what if I put a gargan in the water? Now, you can't see it from this particular photo, but that Gargan is actually in the water. His his foot is actually in the resin. Mm. So does that mean I've thrown away a Gargan because it's now tied to my board? No. The Gargan kit has a couple of spare feet. So it means that I could pour one of those feet in resin, not glue it, but then I could then take that model, one for transport ease, 
Two, I could leave that foot now cast in resin and I could use that model in future armies. Um, so I use one of the spare kits just to recreate what I try to do is tell a story that it's in water. It's awesome. Uh, yep. So that was something funny. And then an unintentional consequence was is that because uh, one thing that I learned along the way was that because of my deep pore resin, it took a long time to cure. And by the time that my photos were, were needed, uh, I didn't cure it in time. So I need to I need to learn, especially with a resin like this, to leave more time for it to cure, uh, which meant that my waves, now I was trying to replicate waves, didn't work because I just didn't have enough time to cure it. Mm -hmm. But people, people thought that they, they were ice and I ran with it. So, so sometimes accidents can happen and they can be quite positive accidents. So there's been plenty of times where I tried something, I didn't intend it to happen. I'm like, oh, that looks really good. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to work with that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, yeah, it can, it can be quite good. Yeah. So it's happy accidents. Yeah, that's right. Um, any, any tips, uh, is the resin heavy? Uh, re resin is heavier than... I mean, it, it has got weight. Um, it has does have weight. Uh, but in saying that, there are tricks that you can uh, reduce the amount of resin that you use. Um, so uh, I know with my current Armies on Parade board that I'm building, I'm looking at ways to reduce the amount of resin. But, yes, it's generally uh, a little bit heavier. Um, a question I had from George was, uh, any tips for finishing the army itself? So, um so like choosing a scheme that is striking but also not time consuming and i think that's a big trade-off is that um many of us probably have unpainted miniatures or maybe don't want to go to golden level demon um like how, how do you build upon an army that visually looks striking but isn't just gonna t you know it's not gonna draw all of your hobby energy and then you just completely tied at the end yeah no that's a good question i i may be the wrong person to ask on that because i'm such a i paint at a glacial pace i'm i am a super slow painter um so i i have essentially one army um and that i've been working on gradually and building building upon for years at this point so um you know vince ventarella definitely has a ton of hobby cheating videos that are super helpful for all of those kinds of things as far as you know um getting good results with you know the the least amount of time possible um and so there are lots of resources out there as well that um you know youtube is a great a great place to go for that kind of thing but um but yeah it's um finding that balance that you're comfortable with, you know, if you need to crank out an army fast, um, or if you really want to take your time with, with things and paint slowly and just really kind of luxuriate on them, it just, you know, depends on where you want to, um, kind of what your goals are in the hobby. So that's a, always kind of a personal choice. I, I, I would respond to that by saying, pick your battles. Um, mm -hmm. now if I was to take this army to a, a competition, you know, a tournament, uh, my local game store, uh, a person could literally get within millimeters and pick up every little mic, you know, microscopic detail on my board, on my, on my, uh, my miniatures. So the level of detail, I would need to, you know, really paint the teeth, paint the eyes, like that microscopic. Mm -hmm. But now that we're doing a, an online competition, it's it's more about what you're doing visually on the photo as well as what you're showing and. Like I, I, I did a whole bunch of detail here on the gargans. You just can't see it. So I think it's thinking about colors to, to be striking, but also not overpowering. Um, like all, all those gargans have red eyes. Now maybe I need, I could done a better photo and done some, some close-ups or some zoom-ins, or maybe there's some things that are just, the payoff isn't there. Um, if I was painting just purely for armies on parade. So I think, I think the, my response would be to pick your battles. Um, I don't know how you feel about that kit. Yeah, no, it's really good advice. Um, yeah, I guess it's with armies on parade, it's a little different, different thing. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think pick your battles is, is exactly the right, the right call. You know, overall composition is going to trump, um, you know, individual minuscule details, um, when you're dealing with a, an overall display like this. So yeah, it's good, good advice. Who's of Doom had mentioned, and I, I do like this question because when I look at your models, um, it doesn't look like many models I've seen before. I think 
uh, it's got a very unique style that you've you've obviously developed over time. And it's good to hear that, you know, and I, I know when I was looking at your models on uh, Cool Midi or not, uh, mm. you've been you've been working on your army since 2018. I think I saw the last the first reference point. Yeah, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe a little longer. Than, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how did you come up with this style? Like, is this something that you just you you intentionally aimed for? Is it something that you you wanted to articulate through your models? Like, I I don't like this style, or I want to kind of highlight X. Like, how did you get to this this style? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think like, like a lot of us, you know, when I was younger looking at white dwarf magazine and heavy metal guides and, you know, Mike McVeigh was like a God to me, you know, just those, those colors that he could get. Um, I was super inspired by, by all the heavy metal work. And I think I, I, for a long time when I was younger, I, I kind of beat my head against the wall because I, I couldn't figure out how to really paint in that way. Um, and as, at a certain point, I think when I came back to the hobby and started picking things up and, and also had the benefit of some, some art training, um, I was much more comfortable with just um, painting in a way that felt, felt right to me and felt comfortable. Um, so, you know, the, painting from a black undercoat is not the way to do things if you're looking for a quick, you know, quick process to crank out an army. Um, you know, but I found that... Um, as far as getting that that kind of high contrast um, with something of this scale that has really, I think, kind of benefited me. Um, you know, starting from a really dark undercoat, you kind of have a, um, a built-in level of contrast. So you um, you can kind of approach the model going from, from dark to light, you know, bringing as much light out as you, you want or as little as you want. So, you know, there are things like, um, like with, uh, I guess, looking at this picture, Neferata with her, her headdress piece, this non-metallic metal and this this non-metallic kind of freehand thing on her dress portion there. You know, those are parts that I um, kind of intentionally um, work more and more on, um, just bringing out the details, pushing the contrast to sort of draw your eye to those areas that kind of pop. Um, but um, I also, I like kind of keeping certain things dark. And so just starting from that black undercoat and going all the way up to near near white um, in certain areas, I find is a really just kind of satisfying way of painting. Um, so I guess like a lot of things, it was kind of born, born out naturally of just kind of um, what felt right and, and getting comfortable with mixing colors. That's That was a huge thing for me too. Um, so very limited palette. Um, I don't have a big range of GW paints. I really have actually maybe under 10 paints that I use, um, but I, I'm constantly mixing paints and, and you know, doing my own kind of, um, uh, kind of putting those constraints on myself. So yeah, it's just something I've, I've kind of found that works, but, um, but yeah, it just has to do with my kind of comfort level and, and what I like doing, so. I, th I think as well, like you're, you're you're testing, you're trying things out. You know, we, we're very fortunate that Darren Latham put out videos uh, about 12 months ago, and I know they're still available if you want to learn the heavy metal style. Mm -hmm. um, he demonstrates at, at, at an heavy metal style, and I hope Games Workshop uh, at some point in time re-empower Darren to, or some someone in the Warhammer community to paint that style. I think people really like painting it, but... If I think about today, we are blessed when it comes to getting into this hobby because you do have so many cool. Uh, there's someone that I'm, I'm, I'm recently following. Uh, I can't remember the full name, but Juan has been doing some amazing armies with contrast, just purely heavy contrast mm -hmm. armies, and getting wonderful results. You know, you got the Vince Ventrellas with the hobby hacks, and uh, I will bring up Todd's Todd's little joke, but it's also partially true is that there's a joke in the mini community uh, YouTubers that they never paint the back of a model because technically if I'm painting for display, I can't see the back of the model. So there is a bit of redundancy. Obviously, if you want to play with the models, you, you need to paint their backs, but there are hobby hacks. Um, and Vince is a great example who demonstrates a lot of hobby hacks, but I think you've also raised some good points. What does an army look like? What does a, uh, a spirit host look like if I start with a black undercoat 
Mm. What does it look like with a grey undercoat? What does it look like with a white undercoat? What what if, what does it look like with with OSL if I do white with grey or black with grey? And you start playing around and you find the effects that work for you and right. they're miniatures. Miniatures can be rebought. Miniatures can be stripped. Miniatures yep. are an opportunity to experiment. Don't be worried about um, uh, about messing up a model. Um, right. And okay. there's Juan's last name. Thank you very much, Paul. He is my, he's my new favourite painter uh, that I've been watching a lot of. So go check out Juan if you are interested in learning about contrast paint because contrast paint is more than just uh, – something that's for beginners it is uh it could get some really cool effects from contrast paints for sure yeah i think you know one just last note on that with painting you know thinking about the the paint as a physical medium um you know i guess that's just a fancy way of saying you know really paying attention to which direction are your brush strokes moving um because you know you are pulling pigment in a certain way and letting it pool in a certain place and just kind of being conscientious of that um so you know a lot of these kind of smooth blends and things like that are really just really thin layers you know thin down paints um one layer at a time um but kind of gradually pulling the pigment where where you want it to go so um yeah, I think just in general, kind of thinking of it as a as a physical, you know, uh, application of a material is is kind of helpful. I know. Um, I know some people in my community. I remember when when I took a class with Vince, um, but also some people in the community, my community at least, have been getting some amazing effects using um, oil based paints. You know, mm -hmm. oil, oil is a slower, drier paint than acrylic paint, which means that you can do a lot better blending. You can do a lot better, uh, the, like the effects or, you know, because it's slowly paint, it means you can feather, you can draw and blend and you can, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make myself look smart here with all the fancy pants art terms. But if you want to learn about this stuff, good news. There's people who talk about art. They talk about the color wheel. They talk about contrast. They talk about all these things and, it, and and i think that's where armies on parade allows me to play with different parts of the hobby and my birthday is next week and one of my birthday presents is i bought myself an airbrush a proper airbrush kit because i want to learn how to airbrush not just for priming miniatures i want to be able to try some of these things so that is that's going to be incorporated in my armies on parade board and it's a way for me to practice so um, use this as a goal or a milestone to stretch yourself and try something different. And for me, I'm competing with myself and the competition as itself is a bonus. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. Happy early birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's still over a week away, but uh, my, my airbrush comes on, on this Monday. Okay. So uh, I'll have to wait. But I think for me, that's just like, I want to, I've gone out and bought a new tool and this tool is a tool and I want to learn how to use it mm -hmm. because then I can, it's just like a, a hardware store. Like I've got a hammer and a hammer serves a role. Uh, the brush is still going to be incorporated, but uh, each year I'm trying something new. I, I first started with a hot wire cutter. I wanted to learn how to manipulate foam. I, I've now been playing with resin. I've been playing with, you know, different things and, uh, and for display boards, I'm now actually getting really good. And I, I really, I'm really happy with, with what I've been able to do in a small period of time. Totally. Yeah. It's all about kind of exploring, getting comfortable with the tools. And yeah, I mean, expanding the more tools you can incorporate, it just gives you more options, right? I mean, um, there's no hierarchy of materials, you know, if you can, um, you know, you just have more, more tools at your disposal and, and more things to play with. So Army Zone Parade is a great, great opportunity to, uh, to do that. Yeah, and it, it, it's not about the metal. I know some people were a bit upset that the local stuff wasn't happening, which meant that they weren't going to get their model, uh, so they wouldn't compete. And I think for me it was more about uh, the, the any medal, any recognition. If Games Workshop had shouted me out, put me on the Twitch stream, put me on the website, that's all a bonus. But if nothing more, I've got a cool display board that I have in my house. I had fun going through the process. I learned a whole lot of stuff. And um, and I was able to share a few photos, at least on Twitter and on Discord, and people were, were pretty happy with it. And I think that was the reward, reward in itself. Um, yeah, man. That's, that's what it's all about. Totally agree. 
Is there any final thoughts that you have or anything that you've kind of learned along the way that we haven't spoken about? I know we've spoken about art concepts and composition with photos. We've talked about the planning process. We've talked about thinking about the way you position and um, and and try to show off the models in the best way possible. Uh, I think I'll, I'll put the link to the, the photography resource from Games Workshop later in this episode. So I'll, I'll put that down, guys, if you want to learn more. Um, we kind of talked a bit about like, you know, the pros and cons on, you know, uh, preparing early versus kind of what I did was rush. <laughs> right, right, right. Or yeah, I, I, I guess, um, you know, with all of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's so easy to, I mean, we're at a time where, you know, with social media, there are all of these great, you know, YouTubers and people posting things online, sharing techniques and how to guides. Um, I guess I would say, you know, also don't be afraid to paint in your own way, you know, in, in a way that makes sense to you. Um, the heavy metal style is great, um, but there are a lot of other types of styles that are totally valid. Um, and you might find that you might have more fun painting in a very different way. You know, um, I was, uh, I love watching Vince's channel, you know, um, the way that he paints is so different from the way I approach things. Um, which is awesome. You know, uh, he's a great painter. Um, uh, I, you know, there are so many different ways to, to do this, this hobby. And so there's not, there's not one right way. So I would say just kind of explore, find ways to, um, uh, to paint that, that makes sense to you. And, uh, but also don't be afraid to ask for feedback too. I know, I know Levy has, has, has made a really good comment and I'll, I will make an active, I already made an active promise that I'll put some links in the description and um, in Discord. But do you have any, any shout outs to the hobby community that maybe would be helpful for you to, to pick up your painting, um, like any resources, any particular people you find most valuable? Yeah. Um, so I guess we mentioned a couple already. I mean, Rob Hawkins, I mean, his blog is incredible. Um, he's a fellow, you know, devotee of, of Nagash. So yeah, big fan of his. Um, of course, Vince and Tom, Warhammer Weekly, Vince's channel. Uh, that's a big one. Um, you know, I think um, podcasts are actually a really good source of inspiration for me too. You know, the Rolling Bad podcasts, I'm, I'm a really big fan of. Um, just as far as um, not so much for direct, you know, painting advice or anything like that, but just, you know, kind of keeping engaged, getting excited about the hobby, you know, um, and just remembering that, you know, this is for fun, right? This is not a, <laughs> just, this is for enjoyment, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of, um, so I know for me, I know, um, so I'll give a couple of other shout outs. So I agree hundred percent on Rob Hawkins, Vince, uh, mm -hmm. rolling bad, the latest episode, they, they, they chew me out a little bit because they, uh, I, accident right. yeah. I accidentally called Bill, Bill Castro, um, yeah. and yeah. I'm going to keep, he's now Bill Castro. So Bill, yeah. I know you're a recent, you're, you're a recent supporter of the channel on YouTube members. Thank you very much. Uh, but you are still Bill Castro. Uh, but he did buy the dice bag, so that's pretty sweet. A couple of other people I mentioned uh, earlier, um, Darren Latham uh, with the heavy metal style. He's um, he's uh, incredible. Uh, Miniac, I think people, um, I, I love watching Miniac's videos. Um, Juan, um, that I mentioned earlier, has been doing really cool stuff with Contrast. And a channel that I'm obsessed with is an Australian guy. Um, he's all about railroad miniatures uh, or railroad display boards. Uh, Luke Towen, um, and I'll put I'll put the I'll put all these links in the episode as well um, later on. But Luke Towen uh, is a he's got over a million subscribers on his channel. But he's a, a railroad display board kind of connoisseur, and just looking to see how he does um, resin, how he does. Um, uh, rock cliffs, how he does waterfalls, how he does, um, like he, he taught me how to, to do, uh, what's it called? Um, static grass. Like there's mm. a static grass applicator that you put the static grass through and it magnetizes it. So your mm. grass stands up like it's legit. And they're like, what the hell? There's all these things that, like these Hearst miniature, like, um, rock cliffs where you can make a yeah. really cool rock, like, it, like watching channels like that, watching some of the Asian channels, like the gun, gunpla, community yeah, and just right, seeing right. the things that like uh i picked this up recently actually from the gun claw it was a i just happened to have this on my table um and it looks like cotton swabs uh -huh. they're actually not cotton swabs they actually help you do eyes 
like it, they, they're perfectly pointed and you just like do eyes and it's so easy. Yeah, that's, there, there are a lot of really cool tools that are just like ingenious like that, that they, they use that we absolutely should be using, you know, in, in this hobby too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've exposed myself so much to these new communities because I'm like, yeah. like I've even started watching some of like the dollhouse kind of things. I'm like, yeah. there's some crazy ideas that come out of these communities that have a place in our hobby. We just don't know about it. So I think that for me, as I've gone through my journey, just grabbing ideas, seeing how people do, um, like just totally, totally. One more. Sorry, I'm totally remiss. Uh, Richard Gray. He is he's the the zenith for me um, as far as painting. I mean, his his kind of command of contrast on such a small scale. Um, yeah that is someone to watch so there's always that's the great thing about this hobby is there's always someone further along than you always someone that you can learn from um but yeah that's it's very cool yeah no that's that's great that is awesome um kit is there any final things you want to say here any shout outs that you want to make uh i do have your twitter below if people want to chat to you more they want to kind of see some of your work I want to ask you about some of the craziness and I will bring up your photo again because it's just outstanding. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of your channel, Anthony. So, yeah, honored to be here. Um, let me know if uh, if we need to talk again. I'm I am here. I'm happy to do so. I guess there are um, a few guys in the, I'm in the Dallas area. I'm in Texas here. Um, but, yeah. You in Dallas? Yeah. Man, yeah. I was in Dallas last year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, were you? Yeah. Yeah. What were you doing here? Uh, I, I I came over to I went to Adepticon. I went to a Bucks party in Vegas. I went. I was in Dallas uh, for about half a week. I had uh, lots of barbecue uh, barbecue meats, which was delicious. Went to Grapevine. Went to go check out the Warhammer Citadel. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm nearby, so let me know. Yeah, um, yeah. We have a really good community here. So uh, the defenders, we are. Uh, there are many of us. So. Yeah, it's a good community. Um, just shout out to all those guys. Oh, shout out. And everyone loves your work, man. Congratulations wow. again on the Dread Artisan Award for painting. Um, it's just outstanding model. And it just shows you that you don't have to go crazy with a two by two. Uh, this was, uh, I don't want to be offensive here. It is simple. It is simple in its design, but well executed. And I think it shows that you don't have to go all in on a display board. You can do an army. You can do it really well. You don't have to do um, a whole 2,000 point army. Uh, you can incorporate things that are around, such as that skull, some old terrain pieces, an old phone, but you can you know, really tell your own story. And I think you've done that uh, perfectly well. So Kit, uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. Whoops, weird, weird layouts. But uh, thank you guys very much. Kit, thank you very much for your time. Thank uh, you. See you guys. I hope you found that discussion valuable. If you did, give the video the old thumbs up. And if you have a comment or an insight, leave it in the comment section below. The champions over here are my AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members. So you guys are bloody legends. Thank you for all the support. If you want to know more about the support programs, the links are below down here in the episode description, along with a link to the Discord server, so we can continue this conversation. Until next time, don't forget to name your characters and have a good one.